You know in the, in the Psalms you see this word called selah? Have you seen it? Do you know what it means? Well, how many times are you going to read it and not find out? I'm, I, I don't mean to be hard. I just, I just think it's crazy to read things in there and read them a thousand times and still not know what they mean. Don't you? Sure. It's not that complicated. I mean, people complicate the Word of God. It's really, it's really not. But it, it kind of... It kind of means like you have this moment and you just can't go on. You need to take a break. You need to pause because it's, this is a time that you need a salah. You know? Um, there's a lot of things you could say about God, but what God really is is he's holy. And um, that kind of, when you sing about it and talk about it and meditate on it, that puts everybody in their place. You know, the, the best of them. I mean, just the best of them. Because we know we're not. But this indescribable, crazy, it's just crazy mercy that he would clothe us in the righteousness of Messiah, Isaiah said. That we would wear garments of salvation and when he looked on the mercy seat and he saw the blood, which made the mercy seat holy, he looks at us and he sees these blood-stained garments of his son over us because how could he look at us any other way? That's crazy. No? I mean, you want to talk about covering somebody. You know what I mean? And... Um, so much I want to tell you in so little time. It just drives me crazy. You know? It drives me crazy that I got to look at my watch. <coughs> you know, I, I had a good friend of mine call me up this week um, from a church in Tennessee. It was a big church, a First Baptist church. It's really big. And, um, He's one of their pastors on staff. They probably have about nine or ten pastors at least. And um, I'm going to go there in October. And he's just a neat guy. We've become great friends. And he has an absolute heart for God. He just loves God. He just loves him. And he, he called me after Yom Teruah. And he said, I have a question. I'm going to Brazil. He started a thing that's gotten very huge. You know, Brazil, Brazil has eight million children, boys, Eight million, counted, eight million boys, 12 years old and younger, living on the street. It's incredible. So he called me and he, for some reason when, when people know you're Jewish, they think you know everything. <laughs> and he was talking to me about um, Golgotha, and he was talking to me about Mariah, and were they the same? How far were they? Because the centurion saw the veil and all this stuff. And he's, he's really going over a lot of details. And I just came out of Yom Teru. And if, how many preachers are here? Okay, so, so if they've done scientific studies that when you preach with passion and, and heartfelt, it's like running a marathon. I know you don't realize that, but afterwards when you come up to me and you ask me a question, I can't even answer it. I'm completely done. It's not that I don't, I stay and I'll hug you and I'll love you. And if you say, I love you, I love you. I love that part. But when you ask me something, I'm done. I'm completely done. I'm wiped out. And so I was wiped out after Yom Teruah. And he asked me and I was like, uh, yeah. I said, let me call you back. And I was just, the Lord was really meditating with me and talking to me. So I called him up five o'clock in the morning. I know he's an early riser with the Lord. I got him. I said, do you have your Bible? And I told him to turn and I was sharing with him something about God's heart when his when his son, you know, and I was sharing with them because, you know, rabbis, traditional rabbis do an unbelievable job with the Torah. They could show you things that a pastor could not show you in the Old Testament. Pastors do a wonderful thing with the crucifixion, but they don't necessarily tie it with the old. But if you're a believer, you should be able to bring it together. A good messianic rabbi can. That's what they do. 
They bring it together and they make it one verse, a universe. And so I was just sharing, I'm not going to share it with you, but when I was sharing this with him, I said, before I share this with you, I don't want to say his name, he's going to be here in a couple of weeks actually. I said, so many people talk to people's heads and they have information, it's good information, but you can't get to somebody's heart if you're talking from your head. Doctrine is important, knowledge is important, theology, but it's not enough. It's like the truth isn't enough with the spirit. And sadly enough, you can be spirited and passionate and not have good doctrine. And we're supposed to be worshipers in spirit and in truth. He said that's what he's looking for, right? He said, me and my pops, we are looking for worshipers. Make no mistake, worshipers who will worship us in spirit and truth. One without the other is, it's not even 50-50. It's not good enough. It's not right. And so I was sharing this with him. I said, do you find, because he's been around. He's a dapper guy. He's just a handsome, he's a pilot. And he's like, he's like 65, but he's like, he's dapper. He looks like an Air Force dapper, you know, like he's just really, you know. And he's sharp and he's a gentleman. And he treats his wife right. He's a gentleman. He's a gentleman in every sense of the word. And um, I said, would you agree with that? And he says, brother, that's what we're missing in the pulpits. And he's been around. His son's a pastor. He's he's been around forever. He said, that's what we're missing. We're getting information, but we're not getting the heart of God. And I said, okay, I I agree. You know, I just want to see if we were on the same wavelength. And I shared this thing with him that one day I'll share with you, just a revelation I got recently. And um, there was silence. You know, when you're talking on the phone and there's 15 seconds or 20 seconds of silence, that's a long time. Just try it next time. When you're No, I know. I mean, I, I just want to make sure it's not the trumpet because I'm like, I'll see you. <laughs> you know what I mean? My bags are packed. Take care. I'm done. <laughs> no, it's the children probably blowing shofars. The next time you're on the phone with somebody, really, just don't say anything to them when they ask them for about 20 seconds. You'll see they'll get real nervous. It's a long time. So he, he, did, you know, he didn't say anything. So I thought the phone died because I didn't charge it the night. So I'm looking at it. I'm ready to click it and call him back and say, I'm sorry, we got disconnected. And he just started wailing, just weeping over this revelation of God's holiness. It doesn't that just doesn't that just say it all? I mean, that scene in Revelation 4, you've got the living creatures who are the guardians of God's glory, and they're just singing it over and over again to God. Right now they're doing it. And you got these elders who have crowned the crown of righteousness. They're crowned. And they can't keep it on. They just put it down and God says, pick it up. They pick it up. Then they put it down. They can't keep it on their head. They can't wear a crown in front of them. They can't even stand in front of them because they feel they just can't do it. Is that amazing? And I personally think in our little country of ours called America, which I love, and no matter where I end up, I will always adore this place. This is an amazing country. I think the most amazing besides Israel. I think they go hand in hand. I just think that we are losing that. I think that they, they blew the, trof- the shofar on the truth. Guys, I, I just think that even our children, when we just tell them how much God loves them, you know, they're going to be willing to do some stuff because... You, you, t- you take advantage of love, but you don't take advantage of holiness. You understand? You just don't. When God's holy, he's holy. And that's something I just want you to remember in this place. You know what I mean? I mean, I want you to laugh. You know I joke around because, but I got to tell you, there was a time where I was trying so desperately to walk in holiness, and then I made everybody uncomfortable, and I realized nobody ever wanted to be around me. And nobody wanted to call me, nobody wanted to talk to me. So I tried to, I tried to become relative and, you know, like hip for the benefit of the people. You know what? It doesn't work. You know what I mean? So, so if, if I offend you, join the club. Um, okay, this is a, a, a Torah processional. And the Word of God is called the Holy Bible. It's holy because it came from holy lips. It was spoken by God. Every word in your Bible is God-breathed. If you don't believe that, you might as well not bother reading it. So we're going to stand as we process God's word.
Simple means sit, relax. Um, you know I've told you a thousand times, maybe more than a thousand times actually, um, that when I first read the Bible back 24 years ago, when I first had my encounter in Israel with the Lord, um, I, um, I noticed right off the bat, I, I'm sure it was revealed to me by the Spirit, but I noticed right off the bat that it was a book of incredible contrast, you know, which I was, I'm simple. I'm not really, um, I'm mathematically inclined. That's why I can remember verses. I almost have a photographic memory when it comes to verses. I can remember verses. I could tell you the chapter and the verse. Maybe I'll miss by one, but I know exactly where to find it throughout the whole Bible. I'm just mathematical. But uh, English, as you could tell, I struggle with. And um, grammatically, in my syntax and everything else, I'm getting better, by the grace of God, uh, as the years go on. But I struggle with it. And um, I like to keep things simple. What did Albert Einstein say about simplicity? If you can't explain it simply, then you don't understand it. And, and one of the things I always felt, if I don't understand it, how can I possibly make you understand it? And simple is, is good. I mean, even you should keep your life simple. Right now, life is very complex, and it's just bearing people. It's just too, it's not simple anymore. And you have, to, you have to work at it to keep it simple. You have to uncomplicate it, because it won't uncomplicate by itself. And if you go, well, I'll just get over this hurdle. No, no, you've got to really attack it. You've got to make a conscious effort. I love the fact that the Bible is just total contrast. Right? I'll give, you, I'll give you an example. I'm just going to give you a few. If I say a word, give me the contrast, biblically speaking. God? Good. Good. Uh, Messiah? No, it's not word association. It's antonyms. It's contrast. Black and white. If I say Messiah, you say? Doing good. Uh, if I say good, you say? If I say heaven, you say? If I say light, you say? Blessings? Rock? Not word association. What did Yeshua teach? You can build your house on the rock or? Yes. If I say sheeps? You see? If I say saints, ain'ts. Last one. The prophetic and the, the pathetic. Yeah. I love you as well. Now, we read a verse from Deuteronomy 32, and even... Moses sung two songs. He wasn't a singer, but he did sing two songs. The first song ever recorded in the Bible is in Exodus 15. And both those songs are totally contrasted. I didn't see it till the Lord said, look at it, kid, when I read the verse. So I just want to show you even the contrast. You know Exodus 15 was his first song, verses 1 through 19. Remember? Sure, they just had got delivered from Egypt. And when he saw all the Egyptian soldiers on the banks of the river, which God said, the Egyptians you see today, you will never ever see again. And when he saw that, he just, you know, in jubilation, when we're excited, we sing. When we're happy, we sing. It's, it's, it's something that, that God has blessed us with, song. And so he just burst it out into song. I think it was a song that God gave him, but, but spontaneously. So let, let's just look at a few verses. I'm not going to go, it's We've got a lot to cover. Okay, so this is the beginning. It says, then Moshe and the people of Israel sang the song. They started singing. It's not like he wrote. They just started, you know, spontaneously singing a song. And it says, I will sing to Adonai, for he is highly exalted. Okay? This is, this is basically starting out the song, who God is. Okay? The horse and its rider he threw in the sea. Yah is my strength and my song has become my So God is our strength. God is our song. That's what we sing about. There's no other song worth singing about than about him. And he's our salvation. Okay? Strength, song, salvation. Simple. This is my God. I will glorify him. I will, I will give him glory. He's my God, and I will glorify him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. I'll lift him up on high. So this is who he is. And then I'm just going to skip verses 8 through 13. This is what he's done. Okay? With a blast from your nostrils, the water piled up. Can you imagine? 
the Red Sea. And I know a lot of people watch movies. Please don't get your theology from movies. Because in the movies, it's like this wide, right? Well, two million people to walk through this, they'd still be walking through it right now. Do you follow? It It was over a mile wide for two million people to walk through in one night. So it's not like he just went, it's, you know, a mile. That's huge. With a blast of your nostrils, the water piled up. The water stood up like a wall. The depths of the sea became firm ground. The enemy said, I will pursue and overtake, divide the spoil and gorge myself on them. I will draw my sword. My hand will destroy them. You blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead. And then he goes, this is the famous song in Judaism, Micha Mocha. Okay, it's, it's just sung in, in conservative synagogues, reformed orthodox, who is like you? It's rhetorical. It's a beautiful song. Who is like you? And it was first sung by Moses. He's saying, who is like you? It's rhetorical. He knows there's nobody like, but he, he has to ask this rhetorical question. Who is like you, Adonai, among the mighty? Who is like you? Sublime. I love that. Sublime. In holiness. Holy. Awesome. In praise. Working wonders. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that just beautiful? This is speaking about um, what he's done. Victory over enemies, deliverance for his people. Can we relate to that today? Has he not had victory over our enemy? And has he not delivered us? It's, it's, spiritually, we can totally relate to this. I think so. You reach that with your right hand. That's his hand of power. Your right hand, that's why Yeshua sits at the right hand. The earth swallowed them. In your love. Isn't that beautiful? He did it because he loved them. He wasn't obligated. He didn't have to. It was a total act of grace. He just loved Israel. He loved these guys. You led the people you redeemed. Deliverance and redemption is different. Deliverance is getting away from the enemy. Redemption is making sure he never gets a hold of you. In your strength, you guided them to your holy abode. Okay, his tabernacle. And then verses 17 through 18, just this is the way it ends. This is what he will do. This is the prophetic part, victory over future enemies for Israel, bringing his people into their inheritance. They're not totally there yet, but trust me, if God said they will, they will. <laughs> you bring them in and plant them. Plant them means they can't be uprooted. Okay? On the mountain, which is your heritage, Mount Zion, the place, you know what that is? Machom. I call Macon Machom. But the place, that's from Genesis 22. Remember when God spoke to Abraham, they were so tight, he goes, meet me at the place. When you got a buddy and you meet at some place, you don't have to say, oh, the, you just go, I meet you at the place. Isn't that beautiful? That's how intimate he was with Abraham. Just meet me at the place. He says, the place, where, where you see the Temple Mount now. Adonai, that you made your abode. See, he married Israel, and he wanted to have a house to live in. You know, when you get married, you, you know, let me make a recommendation. If you get married, don't move into his house or her house. Get a new house. Okay, so he wanted a new house. He wanted a place to, to be with his bride. And the Holy of Holies is where his presence is because that's the bedroom. That's, that's where intimacy takes place with his bride. Adonai, which you or hands have established, Adonai will reign forever and ever. Now, the, this is just a song of elation, exaltation, uh, who God is, he's, you know, what he's going to do. It's just a beautiful, beautiful song. Well, things didn't go as planned for the people, did it? And the second song isn't as, it's just not as upbeat. Um, you see that in Deuteronomy 32, 47 verses, a song. I'm just going to give you a few. This is the prelude. Hear, O heavens, as I speak. He's exclamation point. He's, he's going to um, chastise. Listen, earth, to the words from my mouth. May my teaching fall like rain. May my speech condense like dew, like light rain on blades of gla- grass or showers on growing plants. For I will proclaim the name of Adonai. Come declare the greatness of our God. He's he's imploring them. The rock, his work is perfect. For all his ways are just. A trustworthy God who does no wrong. I love that. Because so many people question God. So basically you're saying he's not doing right. And I'm here to tell you, you're wrong. He is righteous and straight. We're crooked. Okay, now five through nine. In spite of God's faithfulness and goodness and greatness, the people, he is not corrupt. I love, I just, golly, you don't know how much I love this verse. The defect is in his children. We got the defect. We ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now we know good and evil, and sometimes we choose good, and sometimes we don't. A crooked and perverted generation. 
You foolish people, so lacking in wisdom, is this how you repay the Lord? He's your father who made you his. It was he who formed and prepared you. Remember how the old days were? Think of the years through all the ages. They've been walking for 40 years in the wilderness. They're ready to go into their home. Ask your father. He will tell you. Your leaders ask them. They'll tell you. They'll inform you. They'll tell you about your God. When Elyon, the Most High, gave each nation its heritage, when he divided the human race, he assigned the boundaries of people according to it. It was Israel first, and then everything came around it. That was his heart. That was his vision, the apple of his eye. But Adonai's share was his own people, meaning all he wanted was them. He didn't want stuff. God doesn't want stuff. He just wants his children. He's happiest just being, you don't even have to do anything. He's just happy when you're with him. You know what I mean? You know when your kids grow up and, and they grow up and they go and then, you know, you're like older and they come home for a holiday, if you will, and they're all sitting around the table. Jeremy came back last week and he's only been gone a couple weeks. And I said, my, my heart is full. It was like Jacob when he found out Joseph was alive. And it said, Jacob revived. He came back to life. And my four kids were on the table and I was just crying and saying to Bernadette, I'm, I couldn't be happier right now. I don't need anything. You follow? And if I could feel that way, how much more? If I have a smidgen of his resemblance, of his zealum, as we say in Hebrew, how much more does he feel when you're sitting at his table? And you know, we're in a performance-oriented society. We're constantly performing for each other. And God's the only one that says, I don't need you to perform. I just want to be with you. <laughs> Golly, it's so good. I can't take it. Okay. Um, next set of verses, 10 through 14. He guided, instructed, and preserved and loved them. So the question is, why turn to another? He found his people in the desert country in a howling, wasted wilderness. He protected them and cared for them, guarded them like the pupil of his eye. This is where it is, and you see it again in Zechariah 2.8. What's the pupil? It gives vision. If, if you lose your pupil, you lose your eyesight. It's chazon, communication, divine communication. Israel is the apple of God's eye. When you even remotely say something derogatory about Israel and the Jewish people, you are taking your finger and poking your father right in the eyeball. Like an eagle that stirs up her nest. You know what that means? An eagle, when the eaglets have to fly. You know, they're very comfortable. An, e an eaglet's nest is incredibly comfortable. It's like a, it's like a Tempur-Pedic, man. It's like totally comfortable. Because <laughs> they, they set it up that way. But when it's time to fly, they stir it up. And then the eaglet's like, what's going on? And mama says, it's time to fly. And so she takes it on the wings and tilts, and they fall. And they don't know how to fly. Scoops down, picks it up right before they hit. If you ever watch it, it's beautiful. Scoops down, scoops down, and then they start flying. This is what we have to do with our children. Make it comfortable. Don't make it too comfortable because they will come back. <laughs> Once they fly, change the locks. <laughs> Adonai alone led his people. You see what he's saying? No alien God. No. Nope. God's saying, me and me alone. He made them ride on the heights of the earth. They ate the produce of the fields. He had them suck honey from the rocks and olive oil from the crags, curds from the cows and milk from the sheep. With lamb fat, he's Bashan. The cows of Bashan are the most beautiful cows as far as, you know, if you like beef. But um, what, what, what he's saying here is when you guys, you know, like I provided you for you with the best of stuff in the wilderness, like I totally provided for you. Why? I love you. I mean, I love you. I gave you sparkling wine from the blood of grapes. I mean, I, I love you. And then, sadly enough, 15 through 20, they played the fool. They played the harlot. But Yeshurun, you know what that means? Anybody know? Upright. It's, it's Hebrew. You know what it is? It's a pet name. You know how you have a pet name sometimes from the one you love? God has a pet name for Israel. Even when they feel downcast, he says, no, you're my upright one. And if anybody, li, 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 listen to me. If you don't hear anything, I learned something years ago before I knew the Lord. I used to work security in bars. If you have two brothers that are fighting and they're intoxicated, don't get in the middle of it. Listen to me. Can you imagine, how many, how many guys are married here? Okay, stand up for a minute. 
Just picture me going over to your wife and not just disciplining her, but knocking her around a little bit. Now, you know my protocol here, right? I don't. My wife and Denise and all of you know it. If you ever want to come to me a counsel, it's never going to happen without them being there. That's why we have a women's counseling. I don't do it. And I'm not going to emasculate any guy. If you don't want to read the Word of God and you don't want to be the, the head of your household, that's between you and your household. But that's your household. If you want my help, I'm here, but I'm not going to meddle because it's your household. You take care of it. I don't have the authority. I don't have the right, biblically speaking, to, to meddle. You understand? And if a woman says to me, well, you know, Rabbi, my husband doesn't really know the Bible like you do. Well, first of all, I'm a rabbi. I can help. Second of all, I didn't marry him. You did. <laughs> what my recommendation to all you that are standing is, don't let your wife be the high priest of the house. You understand? Amen. Don't you do it. No way. She needs a leader. You need to be that leader. Okay. But my point is, can you imagine me going over and straightening out your wife? Listen, God could straighten out Israel, but don't you try. You understand? Because you're messing with his wife. You can sit. Yes, Sharon grew fat. You know how that works, right? Complacency. I'm doing good. Everything's fine. You know, you see it. Listen, you'll see it in societies. When I go to Africa, Nairobi, people are fat. They make a lot of money. You go to the bush, skinny. India, in the capital, fat. You go to where we have our ministries, it's, you'll never see it. Never. You follow? Because they get, you know, they got a lot of stuff. They sit around and eat and get fat. It happens to all of us, right? But the, the, the physical part is showing what's going on spiritually. You follow? He abandoned God, his maker. He scorned the rock, his salvation. They roused him to jealousy with alien gods, provoked him with abominations. They sacrificed to demons, non-gods. Gods. Now, as I read this, I know, I know how many of you have said in the past, wow, I mean, how could they start arguing in Exodus 16? They were only out one month. They saw all these miracles. How could they do this? Come on, you've heard it from the pulpits and you've said it. I got news for you, buddy. How could you do it? They didn't have the Holy Spirit. You got it. If they were here, if the Israelites were here, they would say, wow, we, we didn't have communication with God. We had to send one guy in. We didn't know what was what. You get to talk to him 24-7. We didn't have power. You have the Ruach HaKodesh. You have a piece of God's Spirit in your tabernacle. You have the power of God. How do you do it? How do you sin? You follow? When one lives in a glass house, one should not cast stones. They ignored the rock who fathered you. You forgot God who gave you birth. Adonai saw and was filled with scorn at his sons and daughters' provocation. Look, some of you, your, your sons and daughters have done really jacked up things, and you get mad. It's, it's okay. That's called righteous indignation. You should. You should. You shouldn't just go, it's okay. It's not okay. Especially when you're sacrificing on their behalf. Thank you. He said, I will hide my face from them and see what will become of them. For they are a perverse generation. So sad. This is not, see, I said this song is a contrast, right? I told you the whole Bible's contrast, and I told you this was going to be a different song. Okay, 21 through 24. We're almost there. He set Israel aside. Why? He had a plan. He had a plan. See, if he didn't set Israel aside, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be a believer. You'd be cutting yourself and throwing your kids to the fire. You wouldn't even have the word of God. You wouldn't even know him. He did this. Isaiah said he blinded their eyes so you can come in. You owe him and you owe them. They arouse my jealousy with a non-God, provoke me with their vanities. I will arouse their jealousy with a non people See, God had a plan. It's not like this took them off guard. Oh, what are we going to do now? Gabriel, quick. Come, we have to have a meeting, emergency meeting. <laughs> my children of Israel, you know, they're my children. They're not paying attention to me. They're not. He had this plan all along before the foundations. Nothing gets him by surprise. 
For my anger has been fired up. It burns to the depths of Sheol. That's the grave. That's not hell. Devouring the earth and its crops, kindling the very roots of the hills. I will heap disasters on them and use up all my arrows against them. Fatigued by hunger, they will be consumed by fever. Did that not happen to the Jewish people? Yes. It absolutely happened to them. But this is the greatness of God. Look at the last three verses. It talks about God's vengeance and God's vindication. It says, They are jealousy with a non-god and provoke me with their vanities i will arouse their jealousy with a non-people uh, uh, vengeance and payback of mine for the time when their foot slips for the day of their calamity is coming soon their doom is rushing upon them yes adonai will judge his people taking pity on his servants when he sees that their strength is gone that no one is left slave or free he says i'm going to vindicate them not because they're good, because I made a promise. I made a promise. And what was the promise? We love this verse. God will never forsake or leave. That means God will never let go or drop. In the Hebrew, it means I won't let go of you. I won't drop you. But this is the key, children. He said that to Israel. That was in Deuteronomy, and it's repeated one place. The book of Hebrews. And the book of Hebrews is written to Messianic Jews. So if you're grafted, you can claim it. If you're part of the commonwealth, you can claim it, and you should claim it. But let it be known, he spoke that to Israel. Now, has history proved God true? You know they should be obliterated. Every kingdom has come against them. And not little kingdoms, the most powerful kingdoms in the world. So he says to the nations, because he blinded their eyes and he brought you in, he says, sing out! Sing out about his people! For he will avenge the blood of his servants. He will avenge. He's the avenger. He will render vengeance to his adversaries and make atonement for the land and the people. He's going to save them. And you might say, why is he so good to them? Well, what's he so good to you for? Are you crazy, ma'am? Are you crazy? That's his bride. You didn't get in through the back door. Don't get me wrong, but still, that's his wife. You can't come between a man and his wife. You're crazy. All right. This Kihilat, this congregation called Beth Yeshua International, some of you have been here as long as I have. We started with a few people, and God had a plan. Not to make this place big, but it goes out. The word goes out. I hear from people all over the world all the time, and I don't say that. I say that because God had a plan. It wasn't my plan. My plan was to be here one year, to teach like 30 recovering Baptists their Jewish roots and split. <laughs> that was my plan. I thought it was his plan. Obviously, he had a different plan. Now, people come here for very different reasons, okay? There's different reasons. Some people just feel the spirit. Some people love the camaraderie. Who knows? Maybe some people like the windows. Maybe some people love Israel. Maybe some people like the preaching, the music. They come for all different reasons. Now, hear me. I'm okay with all of it. Whatever reason it is that you're being blessed, our house is your house. His house is your house. Okay, there's no, there's no membership. We don't go there. We don't call you up and take attendance. You're big boys and big girls. The doors are open. You come when you want. Okay, so just understand I'm okay with it. But I think we have to bear in mind that we are a prophetic movement. Okay, this is not just, listen, there's a lot of groups out there today teaching Jewish roots. I'm not teaching Jewish roots. I'm teaching the Word of God, okay? Secondly, secondly, I don't like Jewish roots movements. I think it's a misnomer. I think it's nuts, okay? It's not Jewish roots. It's the Bible, period, okay? I mean, it's the Bible. It's the Word of God. And, and I teach in a Hebraic fashion because it was written by a bunch of Jews in a Jewish place. And, and the very king of the Jews, the king of Israel, spoke it. So, of course, it's going to be Hebraic. What, what else would it be? But by the same token, this is prophetic. This movement started in the first century. It went away, and it resurrected in 1967. Okay? It's a prophetic movement with a prophetic calling. Now, I just want you to know it so that, you know, you might be here for like a year and go, I didn't know this, and I feel like I didn't do my job. I feel bad. You know? I, I really do. That's, that's my error. That's my mistake, but I'm, I spend so much time discipling that I don't always have time to just go over this, so I just want to go over it, okay? It, it, this, we have a very specific calling here at Beth Yeshua. Somebody might say to me, how come you don't have a hip-hop ministry? 
Well, first of all, God didn't tell me to have a hip-hop ministry. But secondly, secondly, because this has a specific call. Now, we try to minister all over the world, and we do. 196 nations are hearing this message, okay? We have 200 congregations in just India. We do have a downtown ministry in the inner city because I don't want to just be this prophetical. I want to do stuff, okay? But if I miss that call, we lose the anointing. Trust me, we'll lose it. And you might say, well, why do you have to talk about this all the time? First of all, because God told me to. Secondly, because nobody else is. Look in Acts 1, 9 through 11, 3, 19 through 21. You see that acronym? I made it as simple as I could for you. So that when you're trying to explain this to people, you'll have no problem. Just think three rows, I, J, K. Okay? Fair? Three is the number for what? Divine perfection? You'll see a, 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 a triology, a study of three in the Bible all over. Three, just think three, divine perfection. Three rows, R, O, I, J, K. Easy? I mean, I couldn't make it any easier for you. Okay. Listen to what it says. He was taken up that he is Yeshua. He ascended before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. As they were staring into the sky after him, suddenly they saw two men dressed in white, angels standing next to them. The men said, you Galileans, obviously they were from the Galilee, why are you standing staring into space? This Yeshua, whom has been taken away from you into heaven, will come back to you in just the same way as you saw him go. So he ascended from the Mount of Olives. That's where he's coming. His second coming will be the reverse of his first going. Okay? He's going to touch down right at that spot. All right? So what does he tell? Stop looking and wondering when he's coming. Repent. Which is, which is his message. It was Yochanan the Immerse's message. It was Yeshua's message in Matthew 4, 17. It was the message of the disciples. It's, it's the message. Turn away and turn back to return. That's all it is. We have to do that, I think, every day, personally. Now, I know that repentance isn't very popular these days, and I know there's some people that almost never do it. It's a mistake. You will not hear God's voice. Therefore, he says, because he's coming back, repent. I mean, keep yourself chaste. Remember, we just read from Deuteronomy 32. You played the fool. You played the harlot. You forsook the God, your father. He's saying, turn to God so that your sins may be erased. See, if you don't repent, you have them. You own them. They don't just go away on their own. Does anything take care of itself? People go, oh, that will just take care. That comes out in the wash. Yeah, it comes out in the wash if you put the dirty clothes in the wash. It doesn't come out in the wash if you don't wash them. Repent and turn to God so that your sins may be erased, so that times of refreshing. You know, a lot of us are downcast because there's stuff in our tabernacle that's not right. We, and we're doing it on a regular basis. It's not like, you know, it caught us off guard. We're involved in stuff. That's not good. And we won't have the joy. We won't hear the voice of God. I'm telling you, there's, look, God won't be mocked. He's great. He's kind. He's merciful. He's over the top. I can't even describe me so good, but he's not going to be mocked. And if you're involved in something that's causing a wedge, it's going to stay. It's just going to stay. It could be a plethora of things. You know, I don't need to know. I don't want to know. So that times of refreshing, being refreshed, come from the Lord's presence, see? He's saying when you repent and you forsake something and you turn back to him, you're going to feel refreshed because his presence is going to come back into your tabernacle. You follow? Does this make sense? Okay. And he may send the Messiah appointed in advance for you, by the way. People will tell you that this theory or this doctrine of imminency, have you ever heard that? Imminency means Yeshua can come any minute. That was just a scare tactic. He can't come any minute. Okay? First of all, the time is in advance. Secondly, certain things have to happen. How do you know, Rabbi? So I'm ready to read the next verse and prove it to you. Okay? He has to remain in heaven. He has to remain in heaven. Okay, he's talking about when he's going to return. This is what this whole section of Acts is. He has to remain in heaven until the time comes for restoring everything. He comes to restore. As God said long ago when he spoke through, and listen, make sure the prophets you're listening to are holy prophets. Okay? It's easy to call yourself a prophet. You can call yourself anything. I'm not knocking. I'm just saying he's speaking about his holy prophets. He's speaking about the prophets that prophesied in your Bible. So 
let's, let's just look at this for a minute. Yeshua has to stay in heaven until all that the prophets prophesied comes to pass. Does that make sense? Is that Acts 3, 19 through 21? Okay, so we agree. So all we have to do is find out what the prophets prophesied, what has come to pass, and what's still to come to pass. We know that the things that have to come to pass have to come to pass before Yeshua comes to pass. Make sense? So it's easy. By process elimination, what did they say that hasn't happened yet for him to come? When you read in 2 Peter, uh, hasten the day, it doesn't mean that you can control when Yeshua comes. You know, how, you know how sick that is? That you can control God? Hasten means that you wait expectantly. That's all that means. It doesn't mean that you can dictate when he's coming. No. Let's figure it out, okay? First, we want to hit ROI. The prophets spoke about the restoration of Israel. They said that there would be a day when Israel's is restored. Now, she laid in ruins, right, from 70 on. She was trampled, destroyed. They pulled apart the rocks to get to the very gold. They killed one million Jews in 135 with the Bar um, rebellion. They killed another million Jews, and they cast every Jew out of Israel. And they were gone. The people were gone. No Jews in Israel. They were scattered to the, to the nations, and the nation laid in ruins. In the 1800s, nobody even wanted to go there. It was, you can't imagine. It was worse than a swamp. So let's see what they said about this, okay? I, I, there are 700 scriptures. I'm not going to give you 700. I'm just going to throw scriptures at you like boom, boom, boom. It's up to you to study. Okay, let's take a look. First, way back in the Torah, right? Before they go into the land, I don't know your God will bring you back into the land. Now, look, he prophesied this 3,400 years ago. We didn't know it was going to be until 48. But it was a long time because of things that the, the Israelites weren't doing. But in 48, was the nation born in a day? According to Isaiah 66, 8. Can a nation be born in a day? It's rhetorical. No, but with God, all things are possible. Was it? Yes, overnight. Every nation came against it. The United Nations said, you're done. England said, you're done. We're going to blow you off the face of the earth. Uh, how'd they do? Okay, you will possess it. You will, he will make you prosper there, and you will become even more numerous than your ancestors. True? Absolutely true. Let's take a look at another verse. Isaiah 49. Restoration of Israel, ROI. For your desolate places and your ruins and your devastated land will be too cramped. It is too cramped. Do you know that forever there were more Jews living in the United States than Israel? Forever. Now there's more Jews in Israel than the United States. And you know how big it is? Hey, put six and a half million Jews in, in metro Atlanta. Israel is tiny. Tiny little place, 7,900 square miles. Tiny. 8 million square miles of Arab territory. 7,900. 7,900. Little. But there's going to be a time when it's going to be too cramped. It's too cramped right now. It's too cramped right now. Now, Isaiah said this 2,700 years ago. But what I'm trying to get you to see is you're living in the day that Messiah is ready to return. The day will come when the children born, when you are mourning, will say to you, this place is too small, mommy. Give me room. And when Yeshua comes back, it's not going to be 7,900 miles. Because what God promised us is not what we got. Because all we keep doing is giving it away to hopefully get peace. And you give it away, they blow you up. Give it away, they blow you up. Give it away, they blow you up. And the world goes, mm. And the Christians say that. Apartheid. It's not apartheid. God gave them the land. You, you have an argument? Argue with God. That's why I give 100 verses. You know why? Because you, you, can't, you can't yell at me. You've got to yell at God. Argue with him. I'm just giving you the word of God. I'm not doing nothing. Look at Jeremiah. The days are coming, says Adonai, when I will raise a righteous branch for David. Righteous branch for David. What did they call him? Son of David. He will reign as king and succeed. He will do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved. She's not saved yet. Yeshua comes, she's saved. Israel will live in safety. And the name given to him will be Adonai Tzachena. That's one of the names of Yeshua. Adonai, the Lord, uh, our righteousness. Okay, let's keep going. This word came to Yedimiahu, Jeremiah from Adonai. This is what Adonai, the God of Israel, says. Write all the words I've spoken to you in a scroll. For the day is coming, says Adonai, when I will reverse the exile of my people. Israel and Judah, says Adonai. I will cause them to return to the land. 
This was said 2,600 years ago. What can I tell you? It's a long time, but you're, you've, you're living in it. You're not living in Jeremiah's day. You're living today, man. Thus says Adonai, I will return Jacob's captives to their tents. I will take pity on his dwellings. Cities will be rebuilt. Tells, tell Aviv, have you been to Israel? Do you, do you know what that place is doing? The technology, your cell phone was developed there. Your computer was developed there. Anybody wearing Levi Strauss jeans? You don't like Jews? Take them off. Not here. you have any idea the amounts of medicine? Anybody uh, dealing with diabetes? Insulin. You'd be dead. Defibrillator. You'd be dead. Streptomycin. Polio. Penicillin. You, you have no idea. That little 7900 square mile, they supply Europe with 20% of their citrus. They've got the best watermelons growing in the desert. All I'm saying is, I'm not giving them the credit. I'm giving your God the credit. Okay? I'm just telling you it's happening. Okay? I'm trying to get you excited because there is no reason why you shouldn't. And your focus has to change. Otherwise, you're going to be miserable. Cities will be rebuilt on their own tells with palaces where they're supposed Unbelievable. Keep going. Here's what I'm going to vote, the Lord of heaven's hosts. The God of Israel says, this expression will be used again in the land of Judah and cities, for I have returned the exile. May I don't know, bless you, home of Je Holy mountain. Keep going. I'm just going to fire him out at you. For here's what Adonai says, just as I have brought this complete disaster, so I will bring on them all the good I've promised them. Yes, people will buy fields for money, sign the purchase contracts. Listen, this is unbelievable what's going on there. In the Negev, man, you got date palms that are in the desert. Best, date, best dates you've ever had in your life. Unreal. Let's keep going. Here's what Adonai says, you say that this place is a wasteland with neither people nor animals. It was. Judah and the streets of Jerusalem are desolate without people, no inhabitants. There will be again. Sounds of joy. You go there every day. There's a wedding at the Western Wall. Sounds of joy and gladness and the voice of bridegroom and bride, the voice of those who sing. Give thanks to Adonai. Hodu Adonai. For I will cause those captured from the land to return. You get the picture, right? Restoration of Israel. It's not this is what the prophets prophesied. And because it's coming to pass now, Israel is restored. Yeshua is soon to come. At least this part of it. Let, let's find out a little bit more. Let's keep going. Let's go to Ezekiel for a minute. Look at what this says. For here is what, I'm giving you the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. For here is what Adonai Elohim says, I am taking over. This is, this, 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 if this doesn't touch your heart. He says, I will search for my sheep and look after them myself. Like, you know what? The shepherds ain't cutting it. You guys ain't cutting it. I'll go get them myself. That's beautiful, huh? You know what I mean? Sometimes you got to take things in your own hands, Yes. Just as a shepherd looks after his flock when he finds himself among the scattered sheep, so I will look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places. There were 50 Jews in Jakarta, Indonesia. God said, you're coming. They went. All the Jews in the Arab countries, they're there. Jews in Ethiopia, there. There's only one Jew that's got to go. And that's the American Jew. And they're going. The planes are landing as we speak. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm not making this stuff up. It's exciting. They'll have rich pastures. Amos, I'm just going to give you one minor prophet, okay? Just, just one minor prophet. It says, when that day comes, I will raise up the fallen sukkah, the tabernacle of David. I will close up its gaps, raise its ruins, rebuild it. The days will come, says Adonai, when the plowman will overtake the reaper. He's going to be reaping. He's like, come on, get it up. I gotta, we got to plant more. They're flourishing in terms of... The only reason they're struggling, too, is because they got to spend all their money on security because everybody wants to kill them. You know, you know that area, Gush Katif? They gave it up. 8,400 people were living there because they want to show the world, look, we'll give it up. And the bulldozers came in. And I have a friend, and we have a friend, who's a, who's a lieutenant colonel. He had to go in there and pull his own people out. He said he didn't sleep for a week. Pulling your own people out and watching bulldozers break down their, their synagogues. The people were screaming. He was screaming. And then what did they do when they moved into Gush Katif? Fire rockets. Guys, I'd like to tell you that's not the truth, but wake up and smell the coffee. Really, just come on. I mean, do you like truth or you want to live in a cloud? I'm not sticking up for them. I'm telling you the truth.
I will restore the fortunes of my people. I'm here till I have to be here. Okay. But I'm, I'm ready to roll and see Messiah come. That's the restoration of Israel. Now, ROJ, the revival of the Jewish people. You know, they used to say, you don't look Jewish. Tell me what a Jew looks like. Does the guy with the kippah look like a Jew? There's a ton of black Jews. Because the Jews were scattered everywhere. So the prophets prophesied the restoration of Israel. It's done. She's restored, correct? She's restored. Can a nation be born in day 48? And then Yeshua prophesied in Luke 21, 24, Jerusalem will be trampled down until the times of the Gentiles come to an end. The times of the Gentiles have ended. In 67, Jerusalem was back in the hands of the Jewish people. That prophecy was fulfilled in 67. The restoration of Israel that the prophets prophesied, done, check it off. Now let's take a look at this. Revival of the Jewish people, Deuteronomy. When the time arrives that all these things have come on you, though with the blessing and the curse which I have presented to you, and you are there among the nations, you're scattered, to which I don't know you, God has driven you. He did it. Then at last you will stop thinking about what has happened to you. You'll return. You'll make teshuva. You'll repent. I am ordering you to do today, you and your children, with all your heart and all your being. At that point, Adonai, your God will reverse your exile. He will show you mercy. He will return and gather you from all the peoples to which you've been scattered. If one of yours was scattered to the far end of the sky, he'll get you. It's a good God. Isaiah 49. I will turn all my mountains into a road. My high wheels will be raised up. There they will come, some from far away, some from the north. Russia, right? One million came. Some from the west. There are theologians who go, no, rabbi. Replacement theology? No, rabbi. God's, God's not going to restore Israel. He's talking about Babylon. Knucklehead. You, you need a compass? Where's Babylon? It's east of Israel? Do you see only east that Isaiah is prophesying? I mean, do you read the scripture that I'm reading? You don't have to be a genius to see north, west, America. How's this? Sing. Even the land of Sinim. You know what Sinim is? Anybody know? China. China. It's the term for, okay, you know how many Chinese Jews there are? Chinese Jews. They airlifted them from Kaifeng. I mean, Chinese Jews who are, who are devout Jews. Not, not reformed Jews, devout, holding on to the Torah. Sing heaven. Rejoice earth. Break out in song, you mountains. He's like, if you don't sing, I'll get the mountains to sing about it. Don't you understand what this is depicting? This is showing you that you have an amazingly good father. A father who will never turn on his people. If he turns on them, then he can turn on you. If they don't have a leg to stand on, you don't have that leg to stand on. If he breaks the Abrahamic covenant, then he can break the new covenant. Don't you see that by him providing for the Jewish people and you speaking that, you're providing security for yourself? And when you say he forsook them, you are putting words in God's mouth. And it's not good to do. It'd be like somebody saying, oh, Rabbi Greg doesn't love his kids, right? That would be a terrible thing. Terrible thing. But to say that about God, it's beyond terrible. It's demonic. It's called a demonic doctrine in the Bible. That is a, and you know what, you, listen, no offense, you could have a pastor who's as sweet as can be, he might be the nicest guy, he might be the greatest, if he's preaching that, that part of his ministry is a demonic doctrine. 99% could be great, but I'm telling you, that's demonic. It's demonic. For Adonai is comforting his people, having mercy on his own who suffered, but Zion says, Adonai has abandoned me. Which some people say, I don't know, has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her child at the breast as she's breastfeeding and show no pity? Rhetorically saying, well, yeah, and it's happening today. Even if these were to forget, I would not forget you. I've engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are always before me. Can you imagine saying to somebody, oh yeah, God's forgotten Israel. You hear what you're saying? You're calling him a liar. Rabbi, I'm not calling him a liar. You are calling him a liar. I'm not calling him. You are calling him a liar. Ezekiel 
36, turn to that for a minute. ROJ, Revival of the Jewish People. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you from all the countries, and return you to your own soul. You will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people, and I will be your God. We're almost there. Zephaniah, sing, daughter of Zion. Shout, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter of Jerusalem. I don't know your God is right there with you. He's never left. As a mighty Savior, he will rejoice over you and be glad. He will be silent in his love. He will shout over you with joy. I will gather those of yours who grieve over the appointed feasts. The appointed feast, Pesach. We're not in Jerusalem. We've got to be there. And bear the burden of reproach. When that time comes, I will deal with all those who oppress you. I will save her who is lame, gather her who is driven away, and make them whose shame spread over the earth the object of praise and fame. When that time comes, I will bring you in. When that time comes, I will gather you and make you the object of fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes. Now check this out. Isaiah 43 says, don't be afraid for I am with you. Now we quote that, we take it out of context. He's talking to Israel. It's okay, I I get it. I will bring you a descendants from the east, and I will gather you from the west. I will say to the north, remember this? Do you remember what Russia said? You, you guys, you, some of you are old enough to remember the Cold War. We couldn't break that. Russia said, you ain't getting a Jew. We're not letting them leave. What are you going to do about it? We, did, we couldn't do nothing, right? Iron Curtain, what happened? 1970, it was time. God said, I will say to the north, Give them up! A million came. How did that happen? How did the iron curtain come down like a shower curtain overnight? How? Do you, who's God? Do you just quote, you know, around Christmas, oh, all things are possible? Is that just a, is that a bumper sticker? Is it good for a t-shirt? Does it make a nice preaching? Come on, man. Believe it or not. Either the Lord is the Lord of all, or he ain't Lord at all. Pick one. Now he says, give them up, and to the south, don't hold them back. Bring my sons from afar. Okay? When the Ethiopian Jews, now you've got to realize, Ethiopia, they're farmers. They've never seen a plane. Okay? There was an airlift called Operation Solomon, 1991, because Solomon had married an Egyptian, and they called it Operation Solomon. 14,000 Ethiopian Jews were airlifted from Addis Ababa. When they saw the plane, listen, Isaiah, they knew the scriptures, the Old Testament. You know the scripture, right? When they saw it, they knew the prophecy. They were waiting since for 2,700 years. And when these Ethiopian Jews saw the plane, they went, eagle's wings. Iron eagle, it's here. They're taking us home. Can you imagine? They knew the, we don't know the prophecy. Where does an Ethiopian, uneducated, black Jew know about the prophecies and Christians who have so much information don't know squat? They soared and they said, eagle's wings. They wept and they wept. This is the cool thing. I'm just going to tell you one little tidbit. When the plane landed, the first plane landed, they counted when it left. And when they counted on the ground in Israel, they counted again and again because it was 10 more. And they had to keep good records because they had to airlift all of them. And they kept on recounting and recounting and recounting. And then somebody brought this scripture to mind from Jeremiah. Golly, cheapers. Look, I am bringing them from the land in the north, gathering them from the farms, the blind, the lame, women, which, women in labor. Ten women gave birth on the plane. I mean, is God amazing? Is God just... Guys, I'm running out of things to tell you. To me, these prophecies declare the greatness of God more than anything. Do you understand? Captain, you get it? Because these things have come to pass. Nobody's that good. These things have come to pass. 
Listen, we used to be hated in Israel. There's thousands of messianic synagogues. They can't keep us out no more. (laughs) 20 years ago, if you said messianic Jew, nobody knew. Now, everybody there knows the messianic community. It's big, and it's getting bigger, and they are freaking out, and the devil's losing his mind. So we got the restoration of Israel happen, the revival of Jews happening. What else did they prophesy? There's only one thing left. In the Acharit Hayamim, okay, in the last days, okay, take a look at this. Zechariah said, I will make Jerusalem a cup that will stagger the surrounding peoples. 2,700 years old, this is 2,600 years old, forgive me. He says, I'll make it a cup, literally a, a, a cup that they'll drink from. And it will cause them to stagger. Judah will be caught up in the siege against Jerusalem. They're going to come after Jerusalem, but they're going to come after the surrounding areas, Samaria, Shamron. When that day comes, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. Obviously, it's symbolic. All who try to lift it. Now, you can't lift a city. So what does that mean? The word in Hebrew means all who try to divide her. Every time a president tried to divide Israel, a storm smashed him right in the head. Now, people say Mother Nature. I don't know who she is. I never met her, but I know Father God. And I believe he's the head of all weather conditions. Okay? I mean, come on. When our President Obama was talking about it, he backed up to hit, and that was the end of his golf game. Hurricane happened. Kenny Bunkport in, in Maine, the perfect storm. Bush's father, when he said, let's, 40-foot waves, man. He was almost buried. All who try to divide it. So in the last days, all the earth's nations are going to come to try to divide it. I got news for you. It's come to pass, the prophecy. Every single nation in the world wants to divide her. There isn't one nation that says, leave her alone, not even America. There are some Americans but not our administration. They say divider. Okay? What else do we know about the Acharit Hayamim? Paris. Paris. That is Persia. That's Iran. Ethiopia and Put, Libya are with them. Gomer. That is the land between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea with all its troops. The house of Targamar. Far reaches to the north. Russia. The land of Magog. With all its troops, many people are with you. Ezekiel prophesied about a Russian-Iranian alliance. What ships are in the Persian Gulf right now? Who supplies Iran with their artillery? Russia. Who supplies Syria with their artillery? Iran. Hello. Prepare yourself, get ready. That's what he says. You will come up like a storm. You'll be like a cloud covering the land. You and all your troops and many other people with you. It's, uh, it's going to happen. World War III very soon. Okay? But, but, so Jerusalem will be the focus of worldwide atten- uh, contention. That, that's a given. That's, that's already come to pass. And Russia and Iran will try to destroy Israel. That's in process. And then what happens? Go to the next slide.
You know, guys, I want you to know, don't ever, ever make excuses for, for desperately desiring the return of Yeshua. The, the believing community has been asleep for 2,000 years. It's only now that she's waking up. We've had for years dry-eyed Christianity. Too long. I mean, if things are going well, you don't want them to come back. Remember Lot's wife? But it's almost like God's got to stir us up. So for you that are struggling, for you that feel like worn out, oppressed, the enemy is nailing you from either side, why do you think that is? To get you to cry out, Yeshua, come. Because in Revelation, when they do that, he says, Amen, I'll come soon. Do you know for 2,000 years, nobody cried out for him to come? Can you picture him saying to the Father, why doesn't anybody want me to come? Well, because things were good. Things were good. It's not so good now, huh? I mean, for some it's still good, but you'll have your time. How could you not want him to come back? How could you not want him to take his rightful throne? They said, how do we pray? He said, pray, my kingdom come on earth. As in, he wasn't talking spiritually. The kingdom can't come unless the king comes. It's not about you going. It's about him coming. The most important thing right now, the most important thing over even a person getting saved is the return of the king. And this movement was raised to usher it in. It sounds arrogant. I know. I know. I get it. And I'd much rather be in India evangelizing because it's instant gratification. This is not instant gratification. You got to, you know, fight with people because they've got crazy doctrine. You got to fight. Over there, you instant gratification. Preach the gospel on the anointing. People get saved. Boom. Notch in your belt. Good. Next village. Boom. Now, I took some friends with me. It's, it's, it's amazing. If I had my druthers, I wouldn't be doing this. But this is what we're called to do. And it's an honor to answer God's call. So let's look at Zechariah. Let me ask the praise and worship team to come up. Look, a day is coming for Adonai when your plunder, Jerusalem, will be divided right there before you. Don't you understand? People think that she has an incredible air force. Guys, let's think about this logically, okay? I've been there 12 times, okay? You can't tell an Israeli from, uh, from a Muslim, okay? What would it take to bury them? Blow up a bus, right? Headlines, 45 Americans die. Tourists, 45 Americans from Georgia die, and, and they're done. Where do you think they get their money from, mostly? Tourism. It would, it would stymie them. Do you really think it's their military, or you think it's God? Every time I bring some of you over, you, you're just panic-stricken. I always tell you, it's safer in Israel than it is at the Megan Mall. Amen. And whenever you go, what always happens? By the first day, you're like panic-stricken. I think you're going to hyperventilate on the plane. And then you're like, Rabbi, I don't understand. I have this amazing sense of peace. Hello. As the mountains are around Jerusalem, the Lord is all around his people from this time forth and forevermore. You, you feel it there, right? You, you, you just do. It's not there. Yes, they have an incredible military, but come on. Come on. It's, it's good, but come, nobody's that good. Well, there is somebody who's that good. And it says in the Song of Moses, Exodus 15, the Lord is a warrior, the master of war. It'll be divided up. This is horrible. I hate this. But you know what? She's going to be in a position where she's going to finally be desperate, and she's going to cry out. And then Yeshua's going to go, I'm right here. That's what it takes. You know. Let me just ask you, when, when do you pray the most intense? When everything's going well? Sure. We'll be divided up, for I will gather all the nations. They're all coming, right? There's not a nation left that has not surrounded her. She, it's, we're there. We're here. We're here. The city will be taken. The houses will be rifled. Okay. Then Adonai will go out and fight against those nations. Fighting is on a day of battle, meaning it will be the battle of all battles. Like the song of all songs, he, 
This is, this is his fight that he's been waiting to fight for a long time. He's chomping at the bit, and the father's saying, not yet, but soon. Not yet, but soon. Then Adonai will go out and fight. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which lies to the east of Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is here, the east gate, the king's gate, the golden gate, which lies to the east of Jerusalem. It's all cemented up, and the Mount of Olives will split in half from the east to the west to make you Half the mountain will move north, and half will move south. Okay, is that possible? They, they've already discovered the fault line. It's there. Of course it's possible. It's gonna bu- he's going to walk, right? Who's going to be in the temple? The anti-Messiah who's going to claim to be Messiah, and that's the abomination. He's going to kick open the gate. He's going to nail him. He and his false prophet who does miracles, don't look to miracles, look to the miracle worker. He's going to cast them right to the abyss. They're done. Then he's going to chain up the adversary for a thousand years. He'll teach without any interruptions. Won't it be nice when we finally take some accountability and we can't pull the Flip Wilson? The devil made me do it? It's not going to be there. Let's keep going. On that day, there will be neither bright light nor thick darkness. And one day known to Adonai will be neither day or night. Although by evening there will be light. Because the light of the world will be residing with us. On that day, fresh water will flow out of Jerusalem. He's talking fresh water, yes. Legitimate fresh water into the Dead Sea. But also living water. Half towards the Eastern Sea and half towards the Western Sea. That's the Mediterranean. Both summer and winter. Then Adonai will be king over all the world. I told this to you for Yom Teruah. I think right now, burning that and I are in a, a very good season. I don't think we, we, we could have a much better relationship. Um, we've been together 24 years. Um, I had to deal with a lot. <laughs> I've, I've learned patience and... Get away from striking distance. And... You know, the ministry is, is beautiful. It's bearing a lot of fruit. You guys are... I, I'm telling you, I take on hell with a water pistol with you. No ifs, signs, or buts. You might think I'm a little crazy, and you might think I don't think you. I think you all the time, and you're like my kids, and I would, I'm telling you, I'd stick up for you no matter what. No matter what. They'd have to show me. They'd have to show me video before I'd let somebody talk about you. And so things are good, but my soul, I can't explain it to you why my soul constantly cries out for Messiah. And, you know, when, we, when you're in an international ministry, you get emails all the... You know how many emails I just get from Samuel in India about what's going on there? The devastation, what they're doing to children? We almost at our point where we can't hear it no more. Not that I want you to stop. I'm just telling you, it's, that's the heartache. This is the heartache, seeing people, the destruction and devastation of sin and seeing the adversary gain ground. It's heart-wrenching. It's, I hate divorce. I hate uh, any molestation. I don't care, young, old. I, I hate the manipulation. I hate it all. I hate it. And so my soul, it's not my, it's the center of who I am. It's, it's deeper than, I'm not in control of it. It's constantly crying out for Messiah. You, you, you know what I'm talking about, Right? Okay, this was long and I apologize, but let me just end this way. You remember Israel's history, Pharaoh and the Egyptian Empire. They tried to annihilate Israel and the Jewish people, yes? Kill all the boys. Throw them in the Nile. And what came out of it was the Passover feast. We had a party. And Haman and the Assyrian Empire tried to annihilate Israel and the Jewish people. And... We had the Purim feast party. And Antiochus and the Greek Empire tried to annihilate the Jewish people and Israel. And we had the Hanukkah feast. These last days, the Acharit Hayimim that you are currently in, the world of nations will try to annihilate Israel and the Jewish people. Messiah will come and we will celebrate 
the wedding feast. Last but not least, four verses. I'm going to give it to you in three versions because the Lord said so. When Yeshua was teaching about the last days in Luke 21, this is what he said. There will appear signs in the sun, moon, and stars. And on earth, nations will be in anxiety and bewilderment at the sound and surge of the sea as people faint with fear at the prospect of what is taking, overtaking the world. For the powers in heaven will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with tremendous power and glory. When these things start to happen, stand up. Hold your heads high because you are about to be liberated. Let me read it again. Stand up, enjoy yourself. Let me read in the New Living Translation, just for those who like the New Living Translation vernacular. And there will be strange events in the skies, signs in the sun, moon, and stars, and down on earth the nations will be in turmoil, perplexed by the roaring seas and strange tides. Have you not... Listen, do the study on it. It's, yes, there's always been tsunamis, but not like now. The courage of many people will falter because of the fearful fate they see coming upon the earth, because the stability of the very heavens will be broken up. Then everyone will see the Son of Man arrive on the clouds with power and great glory. So when all these things begin to happen, stand straight. Look up. For your salvation, Yeshua, is near. Last but not least, it will seem like all hell has broken loose. Sun, moon, stars, earth, and uproar, and everyone all over the world in a panic. The wind knocked out of them by the threat of doom, the powers that be quaking. And then, then, they'll see the Son of Man welcomed in grand style. A glorious welcome. When all this starts to happen, up on your feet. Stand tall. With your heads high, help is on the way. Shabbat Shalom. I, I got to lay down. It's just come on together. Let me bless you. And I'm going to just take this in. You know how pleasing this is to him. He's, he's constantly getting praise and glory. And, and then he has this little nomadic group made up of, you know, it's like a big believing bowl of granola, a bunch of fruits and flakes and, <laughs> and nuts. They're all so quirky and, and yet, you know, it's all come together so beautifully. And you got this little, you know, group just screaming out, you know, come out of Macon, Georgia. Who would have thought? Well, thanks a lot for, for being who you are. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his very countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the principle of peace. Fiasem lecha shalom. Shabbat shalom.